Hey y'all, happy Tuesday. I should have cleaned this camera, my bad. How y'all doing? Let me know where y'all watching from. There we go, a little bit better. How y'all doing today? Are y'all ready to elevate? Are y'all ready to grow? I mean, because what are we doing if we're not ready to do those things um, in 2024? So as you hop on, let me know where you're watching from. Let me know if you can hear me too, um, because this Strategy Tuesday is going to be fire. It's going to be amazing. I'm just trying to make sure all of my... Um, all of my announcements went out. So give me one second as we wait for other people to come in. If you haven't liked the video, please like the video. Share it with a friend because it's going to be amazing. And y'all, we have a lot of new people in the community. Um, I don't know what's been going on, but we have a lot of new folks. Like maybe like 75 new people have been added um, to the channel over the last two weeks. And so I'm super excited to welcome y'all. Hey, if y'all don't know me, my name is Dr. Brianna Whiteside. Um, I am an English professor for right now. I am a strategy coach. I am a kingdom builder, and I am happy to help you strategize into the future. Um, we're so happy to have you over here. So happy to have you over here for real. Hold on. Give me one second. Um, and I hope you're ready to grow because when God gave me, when God gave me this idea to do strategy Tuesdays, he probably, he likely, well, nine times out of 10, he had you in mind. Um, and so I want to honor that. Okay. Y'all today we're talking about, I don't know if they're like business secrets from the Bible or if they're like life secrets from the Bible, we're just look, talking about the Bible. And we're going to tonight, today, we're going to talk about elevation, sustainability, and scalability. Today, we're going to talk about elevation, sustainability, and scalability. Hey, Nikki girl. Hey, Vanessa. Story of Derricka. Hey, girl. Hey, Marshall. Hey. Hey, Heather. Um, all right, y'all. Hey, love to life tea, Sabrina. Hey, girl. Hey, y'all. I feel like we friends. Like, I don't know why, but I get so excited to chat with y'all. So, hey, good to see y'all on this Tuesday morning for some afternoon for others. If you haven't liked the video, please like the video. All right, y'all. Look, we're going to be on here probably an hour. I know I've been trying to do 30 minutes, but this one, we're going to slow walk, and so it's going to take me an hour, but I promise we're going to get off, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to be here long. I promise. Hey, Lexi. Lexi, I owe you a text back. I'm going to text you back after this. Um, all right, y'all, we're talking about ultimately managing increase, how to effectively do that, but our, um, our subtitle today is Elevation, Sustainability, and Scalability. Um, so let's hop on into it. Today's mentor is Joseph. Today's mentor is Joseph. That's my homeboy. He became my homeboy when I started studying this. Joseph is my homeboy. Have y'all ever heard, you know, when, when, when people generally teach Joseph, they generally teach like from the pit to the palace. Have y'all ever heard that? Let Drop in, drop in the chat if you've heard people say, from the pit to the palace. Because I've heard it and I, not by not reading the text, like, you know, so many of us, no shade, I'm guilty too. For so many of us, I'm like, oh, so this is just like from the bottom to the top, started from the bottom, now we're here, you know, but that's not really what happened. <laughs> that is not really what happened. And if we want to get the full understanding of how to elevate, sustain the elevation and scale, in 2024, then we're going to have to go ahead and go to the text. So we are going to Genesis. Where is Joseph's story? Genesis 37. But I'm going to give you some preliminaries before um, I hop into the text. And so I'm going to we're going to walk through what managing means and things of that nature, because I don't want to take for granted that everyone knows what the Bible means when we're talking about managing anything. So um, for my admins, I'm going to go ahead and drop the main points in the chat. If y'all can just like drop the scriptural references, 
it will take some work off of y'all. I know y'all be over here typing because I move fast. So just drop the scriptural references as I give them and I will drop uh, the main wording of it. But we are going to Genesis 27. But before we get to Genesis 27, can I ask you to like this video, please? There's 16 of us here right now. All right, so let's talk about what managing means, right? Because we know that we are supposed to be stewards of God's stuff. None of this is ours. He's literally letting us manage his stuff, okay? So what does it mean to manage? To manage means to handle or direct with a degree of skill, to exercise, ex uh, execute administration or supervisory direction. I've just butchered that. Let me say it again. <laughs> Managing definition means to handle or to direct with a degree of skill. So you know that God sees you as skillful already because he allowed you to manage his stuff. It also means to administrate and it means to, to do supervisory direction. Let me drop that in the chat for y'all. Come on, let me do it in chat. All right. So I told you that uh, this definition to remind you that as a son or a daughter of God, you're a manager and not an owner. That takes some pressure off of you. When you are a manager, you don't have the ownership pressure. How many CEOs do we have here? How many people who own businesses I have on here? You know that if you're owning anything, a home, anything, you have this pressure that you carry. But you don't have to have that ownership pressure because this stuff ain't yours. You're just the manager. You're just the manager. So take the pressure off yourself. God is trusting you to manage his affairs on earth. It's his stuff, not yours. It's his stuff. Okay. So what does it mean to increase? Because we're ultimately talking about managing increase, right? That's our umbrella term. Uh, what does it mean to increase? Increase means to become progressively greater as in size, amount, number, or intensity to make greater or to enrich. I'm gonna repeat it and I'm gonna drop it in the chat for you. Um, I'm sorry, I cut off the I in increase. Increase means to become progressively, that's our active word there. It means to become progressively greater as in size, amount, number, or intensity to make greater or to enrich. And progressively by definition means to making use of uh, or interested in new ideas, findings, or opportunities. Progressively by definition means making use of or to be interested in new ideas, findings, or opportunities. So you should always be in this curious state as a believer or just as a human. You should always be curious as to what's next, progressively moving forward. I looked up to enrich because that's one of the definitions of increase. To enrich means to make rich or richer, especially by the addition or increase of some de desirable quality attribute or ingredient. I'm telling you, y'all, it's going to all make sense. Let me drop these definitions in here for you. To enrich. So for all the people who don't think that God put you on earth to be successful and profitable and all this other stuff, that's not true. That's not true, because if he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and if he owns the cattle of a thousand hills, you quote that. Why would he put his kids on earth to suffer? You are what? An heir, which means that your father owns the kingdom. You are a joint heir with Christ. That means that you got the stuff, too. He's not poor. He's not broke. He's not scared to give you money, wealth, prosperity, anything. But if you choose that you don't want it, he's not going to make you have it. That's all I'm going to say. Right. And we're going to see how we must choose to agree with God every step of the way. So let's just quick recap. By definition, increase means to become progressively greater or richer by making use of new ideas, findings, and opportunities. So I looked up the biblical meaning of increase, right? Because those were the dictionary. That's what Webster gave me. When you look up increase in the Bible, it means to produce it means revenue, it means income, and it means to gain wisdom. The Hebrew meaning of increase, to produce revenue, income, to gain wisdom. So for everybody saying, God don't care about this, then why would he put this word, these words in the Bible? Why would the Bible use these words? 
I'm just asking a, like a A plus B equals C question, an elementary question. Look up product. Product means something produced by physical or intellectual effort, output, or handiwork. What is a product? It means that something produced by physical or intellectual effort, output, or handiwork. This means that you should be producing products in order to increase. It's right here in the Bible. And I'm trying to copy and paste it, but it's acting like it don't want to let me do it. All right, let's keep moving. What is revenue? Revenue means the gross income returned by an investment. Remember last week we talked about investing in seven or eight ventures. This builds on that teaching. Revenue means gross income returned by an investment increase measured in money that comes from labor, business, or property, proceeds, or profit. Revenue means you're going to get money <laughs> from your labor, your business, your property, your proceeds, or your profit. So this lets you know these are some of the ventures if we look at it that way, right? All right. What is wisdom? Because that's another definition of increase. Wisdom means skill in war. Skill in war, wisdom in administration, and prudence. It means skill in war, wisdom in administration, and prudence. Dropping it right here for you. Wisdom means skill in war. Let me tell y'all something about skill in war. Um, I had two things that I was asking God about, I had two frustrations in my life over the last few months. And I was like, God, you know, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Like, I know I'm doing the right thing. This is not a question in my mind if I'm, if I'm in alignment. But what I'm doing is not producing the results that I sense that they should be producing. We're talking about skill and war. And so I'm like, show me what is happening. Because obviously there's something that's happening that I'm not aware of. Y'all know he showed me a dream of what was happening. A dream of what to pray against. I said, okay, thank you so much. Another time, and I haven't fully studied this out, but this is a recent thing. This is in the, in the element in the, realm of, in, in the realm of finances. And I've only talked about it with a few people, um, but it's in the Bible. Do y'all know when Jesus starts, when he tells them to go get this money out of the mouth of the fish? And you know, fish are generally in the sea. And, I, and, and as I'm, I'm talking to God about finances, he reminds me of that story, right? Go get this money out of the mouth of the fish. And I said, why is this significant? That means that if some finances are held up, they're held up in the marine kingdom in some way. Because a fish is in the water and it is in the, in the marina. That means it's held up and you need to call it forth from that kingdom. I tell you this to say the money that was held up was released. That's skill in war, right? That is increase. It was held up. It was mine. It was mine. I didn't come crying, spinning and farting. I said, what is happening? He showed me. It's right there in the text, Brianna. But you, we like to think of these stories as just stories and not str strategies hidden in plain sight. It also means wisdom and administration. It means prudence. And if you don't know what prudence means, prudence means skill and good judgment in the use of re resources. OK, so what is the Greek meaning of increase? So I just gave you the Hebrew meaning of increase. Now, let's look at the Greek meaning of increase. The Greek meaning of increase means to cause to grow, to increase, to become greater or to grow up, <laughs> to cause to grow. Uh to augment, to increase, to become greater or to grow up. And what does it mean to grow, to spring up and develop to maturity, to expand, to have an increasing influence? So as you grow, as you increase, your influence is supposed to naturally grow. It is. And what does it mean to augment? To augment means to make greater, more numerous, or to accelerate. So by spiritual law, y'all, as a believer, you operate under spiritual laws. By spiritual law, Increase comes from revenue associated with growing in a skill 
The Bible says, see a man skillful in his work. He will not stand before mere men. He will stand before a king. So uh, by spiritual law, increase comes from revenue associated with growing in skill, wisdom and production, whether through labor, business or property. So the first thing you should you should know is that managing increase is directly attached to managing moments. Someone put that in the chat. Managing increase is directly attached to managing moments. In society, you know, we've been taught to look for those grandiose moments and then we ignore the small moments, but it's in managing the small moments and detours that we are able to get to those big moments. So in this teaching, now we're at the teaching. All of that was preliminary work. In this teaching, we're going to use Joseph's life to study proper increase management or to study how we're able to um, elevate, sustain the elevation, and then also scale. So we're trying to move up, we're trying to move lateral, and then we're trying to scale up again, okay? And this is our strategic plan for today. Um, so we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at how he managed moments and how he managed the increase because the two are interconnected. So let's go ahead and go to Genesis 37. We're going to move in and out of these chapters, but I want you to go back and study it on your own after I give you all this strategy. So Genesis 37, 37 opens by basically informing us that Joseph is an employee in a family business. Can we agree there? Joseph is an employee in the family business. He's tending the sheep. He's helping out the family. This is a family business. At the basic level, what he's doing, his occupation when we meet him, he's in a family business. So your increase is attached to. So once we learn that, then this is where the preachers generally turn up when they start talking about, you know, don't tell all your dreams to everybody, dream killers. And I, I get that. I get that. So if we move down a little bit to Genesis 37 and 7, though, like moving away from the hater talk, moving away from people not liking you, move. let's move away from that and look at what's really happening here. In Genesis 37 and 7, we learn that your increase is attached to God-given dreams, visions, and destiny. That's point one. Your increase is attached to God-given dreams, visions, and destiny. Genesis 37 and 7 and 9. So at 17, Joseph has two dreams, and he tells his brother and his father. Dream number one is in verse 7. It says, when we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood, up, and stood upright, while the sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. In verse 8, his brothers interpret the dream. Right. So Joseph is not interpreting the dream. Joseph tells the dream in verse eight. We see his brother interpret the dream and they say, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? Joseph hasn't said that. He just told the dream. So there this lets you know that the family also has the ability to interpret dreams. This is a familial gift. Dream number two, we find it in verse nine. It says, then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing to me. In verse 10, his father interprets the dream. His father says, will you, will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? This family is gifted with dream interpretation. It's not just Joseph having this gift to interpret dreams. This is a family trait. This is a family trait, y'all. I need y'all to see this. This is not because Joseph is so, is so special. This is a family trait to interpret dreams. Jo it had to already be in a family before it touched Joseph. Sometimes, and this isn't in the notes, but sometimes we think those things that are family traits, we think that they're not, they're not significant. So we move over them like, oh, this is nothing. But it is those family traits, those positive things that God instills in any in every lineage to help elevate the entire lineage. So there's a branch of my family that can cook. I can't. I didn't get it. So we had two sisters in my family. One can cook. One was good. At, well, one can cook, and I don't know what the other was good at. Anyway, one lineage can cook and throw down. They may not monetize it, and they not, might not use their gifts, but they can. If they did, they could. I didn't get my branch didn't get that. My branch 
got administration. My branch got business acumen. Which means when y'all see me showing up and moving in the way that I am moving, it's because this is a familial gift. So God gave Joseph um, the big picture in a dream, but Joseph must walk out the steps, right, to get to the destined end. His his brothers and his father have already interpreted this is what this is God's plan for you. So yes, the vision will be glamorous. Y'all know this. God gives you this big vision, and you like he, and then you say yes. But he gets you at the small print. He shows you the big stuff. You're going to have this, that, other, da, 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 da. You like, you sing, you should kind of glory, thinking yes. And then that process kick in and you cry, spit, and fart, and you saying, no, like, I don't want it no more. But you need to understand that when God shows you the big picture, that means that you do have this intended end if you walk out the process to get to the end that he showed you, right? So number one, just a quick recap. Your increase is attached to God-given dreams. What did you dream? What strategy, what, what did you dream for your life? What vision did God give you? And what did he tell you about your destiny? That's number one. Number two, and it's going to be 20 of these that we're going to work through, which is why it's going to take me so long, and I'm probably going to be over an hour. Number two, proper stewardship is necessary in, increase, in infancy of increase. So in your beginning stages, you need to... Practice proper stewardship over the little stuff. We we don't like that part though, right? But the Bible tells you if you will manage the little, God will make you what? Ruler of much. Any idea in its infancy needs to be nurtured and cared for just as um, carefully as the big dream does too. I would, I would go as far as to say that your smaller dreams need more attention than the big goals anyway. But let's, let's, look at, let's look at it from the text. Let's look at the beginning stages. So we see that God jo shows Joseph his future in a dream. But what if Joseph would have just dismissed the dream instead of recording it? This is why you need to pay attention to your dreams. Because Joseph could have just dismissed it and not, and not record it, right? He had to steward this dream. And I know we don't see him writing it down, by, but the act of telling his brothers and father the dream is an act of recording it, okay? By, by externalizing this dream, it is an act of recording it. So you must pay attention to your dreams. I already told y'all two dreams. I got a strategy for one, well, two strategies, money, and to tell me what was happening on how to pray. So pay attention to your dreams. God may be revealing the future and even future strategy in those dreams. Do not discard them. I know we tired sometimes. So this is what you can do. Here's a strategy for recording your dreams. You tire and you wake up in the middle of the night to go use the restroom, but you don't feel like getting up writing it. Get your phone. That's probably by your bed. Turn on your voice note and record the dream in your voice note and go back to bed. The next day recording and revisit it. That's a strategy I use. And it helps me keep track of my dreams. But here's the thing that you should also understand that the Cordance classifies dreams as the lowest grade of prophecy. The concordance tells you that your dreams are some are nine times out of 10, the lowest grade of prophecy. This is why you need to pray for pray, uh, record them. So you don't, you don't have to go get a prophetic word. God is giving you a prophetic word in your dream because that's the lowest grade of prophecy. Number three. Number three, these are things to remember. We got 20 of them. I need to hurry up. Number three, others might be uncomfortable with where you're going. So be prepared to lose them. This is where people struggle. Okay. You know, so we generally talk about the fear of failure, but there is a natural fear of success. And it's not that people don't want to succeed. It's that people don't want to lose people along the way. This is why people generally say it's lonely at the top. Don't start rehearsing that and saying that because it's not. It's not lonely at the top. Okay? You're going to meet other people at the top. But it's not lonely at the top. Do not let that be your confession. But people don't want to succeed because you know naturally people are going to fall off. You're not going to be friends with the same people that you may have started off with if they don't have the capability to ascend with you. This is why you need God to send you kingdom friends, kingdom mentors, people who are able to ascend as well, who have capacity. 
it's hard when they fall off. But let me tell you something. I would rather experience the pain of them falling off than experience the pain of me not becoming everything that I was created to be before the foundations of the world. You get to choose though. But ain't you tired of being down there? Ain't you tired? What you doing down there anyway? Aren't you tired of being lower than who you were created to be because someone else decides not to grow? The devil is a liar. We would not do that. So don't get discouraged when people don't support you. As we see with Joseph in verse eight, his brothers hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. We also see it in verse 10. His father rebuked him and to rebuke means to criticize sharply. So we have his brothers hating on him, his father criticizing his dream sharply. He doesn't feel like he has this support. However, there is a word of the Lord over his life. And we're going to see how he begins to steward this, these dreams when he was 17. Sometimes, y'all, the vision that God gives us may cause others. This is something that you must be reminded about and also work through. The vision that God may give you might cause others to be reminded about where they are not in life. That is not your problem, though. It could also make them feel insecure. And you have to be prepared for that. But that does not mean that you lessen yourself. That does not mean that you come down, Nehemiah, off your work. That does not mean that you try, you try to shrink yourself into a box that you don't fit in. That they can, they can ascend to in their lives if they decide to. Your job is not to come down. I always tell the people connected to me, and this is true in my life. And if you can look over your life, you will realize it, it's true too. It's easier to pull someone off a chair than pull someone up on a chair. It's easier. The motion is easier to pull down than to, put, to lift up, right? And so if these people fall off and people you may not be supported, it's okay. God will bring you destiny supporters as you continue to move on. It's okay. He's not going to leave you out there. There's safety and community. He's going to bring you the right community, Right? And I don't want you to stop progressing in life because you don't feel like you have support. I don't want you to stop moving forward in what God is telling you to do because you don't feel like you have the applause. If you wait for the applause, you're going to die before it ever comes. You have to go forward and you have to be what? Decided. Okay. So that was number three. Number three was others might be uncomfortable with where you're going. So be prepared to lose them. It's okay. It's okay. Number four. Let's walk into it. Your increase or future will be challenged by potential sabotagers to test how committed you are. Your increase or future will be challenged by potential sabotagers to test how committed you are. So in verse 20, bro uh, Joseph's brother said, come on, come now. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. So they only did it because of the, the greatness that Joseph dreamed of himself. They only did that. This was a revengeful act. They wanted to stop the dream. They wanted to stop the destiny. They wanted to kill him from no other reason but to stop it from coming to pass. So when you're on an assignment from God, your opponent, whether it be your enemy or real life ops, it could also be you. You could be the op. Um, when you're on an assignment from God, your opponent will always plant people to prevent you from achieving your destiny. You must be aware of this and you must be alert and discerning. OK, it could even be people in your family. That's a hard pill to swallow, but it won't stop you unless you let it stop you. OK, number five, let's move through. Number five, you must remember that your increase Come on, let me paste the, the thing. Your increase is attached to your connection with God. I think we know this one really well. But just in case you need a reminder, your increase is attached to your connection with God. And this is when we move into Genesis 39. Joseph is sold to Potiphar's house. And in verse two, it says, and the Lord was with Joseph. And so he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. What does it mean to prosper? Prosper in the concordance means to advance to succeed, and to be profitable. So Joseph's family is hating on him. They're upset. They don't want his dream to come to pass. They sell him. He go in a ditch. They sell him to a caravan. 
he ends up, so he goes down, right? So family business, he goes down. There is this pit experience, this low level, this low experience before he elevates. When he sold though, he moves into where? Potiphar's house. Let me tell you what this means. He did not go from the pit to the palace. He went from the family business to a manager of a private estate. Y'all see that? Family business, sheep, goats, all of the animal stuff. Family sells him. He goes into a low point in business. But the next level is a manager of a private estate. Why do I say that? Why do I say he was a manager of a private estate? Well, verse three through six tells you, it says, when his master saw that the Lord, and this is Potiphar seeing that the Lord is with Joseph, it says, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in his house and in his field. So Potiphar left everything in Joseph's care and Joseph was in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Joseph did not go from a pit to a palace. He went from the, this is, this is how we're moving step by step. And then we're going to get into sustainability. We have him moving from the family business. He's an employee to a manager of a private estate. This is an upgrade. This is a scalable upgrade, right? This is an upgrade we can track, but it did not come before Joseph had to manage that low moment in his life. So I went into prosper, right? I was telling you about what prosper means in the Bible. Um, verse two says, and the Lord was with Joseph. So he prospered um, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Okay, so prosper according to the concordance means to advance, to succeed or to be profitable. But by definition, prosper means to succeed in an enterprise or activity to achieve economic success and to thrive. So when God says, tells you to prosper, he's literally telling you to advance, succeed and be profitable in an enterprise or whatever activity you decide to do. He's also telling you to achieve economic success, which ultimately means to thrive. Y'all see where I'm going here? Am I moving too fast? Let me know. Let me drop these definitions in the chat. All right. So, so we so ultimately our fifth strategy builds on our fourth strategy, right? If you maintain your close connection with God, this is no time for you to pull away from God. This is no time for you to do that. If you maintain your connection with God, then God's favor will shine brightly upon you, which will attract others to you. Let your light shine, right? Causing them to favor you, and that will trigger another level of elevation. Potiphar elevated Joseph because he perceived God was with him. So Joseph, again, family business from family business to manager of a private estate. Number six. Whew. Our number six. To manage, increase properly, you must manage God's decrease. To manage, increase properly, you must manage God's decrease. And this is the hard part. Because I don't, if, if you're increasing me, you should not decrease me. That's what I think, right? We get frustrated. Like, why are you decreasing me? Because he's like, I'm really trying to increase you. But I have to bring you down a bit. I have to mold you to shoot you to the next level, right? So by God's standards, we've heard this a lot. The way up is down. And we must manage those seasons well. The way you manage your down seasons matter. You can't just be out here going to the street, even though I know you want to go to the street because your feelings hurt. But you have to manage your down seasons well. Joseph is thrown into a prison because of the lie. We know the story. Um, Potiphar's wife lies. Potiphar's like, all right, cool, throw this man in jail. So now he's back at a low point in his life, even though he was just manager of the estate. Now he's in prison, right? 
and he's in a down season, but God prospers the, prospers the work that he does, even in the down season, which means that you should still be doing some level of work in your down season. You can't just do it on a mountaintop. You got to do it in a valley. And how do I know this? When we look at verse 20 through 21, I believe we're in um, Genesis 39. When we look at verse 20 through 21, it says, but while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So this is like a repeat thing here. Potiphar didn't pay attention to anything in his household except for what he ate. And now here we have the warden, though Joseph is in the prison, not paying attention to anything under Joseph's care because why? The Lord was with Joseph. You have to maintain the connection in a down season. So we don't know what progress looks like for Joseph in his down season. We could say your wilderness or your dry season, but we do know that it is recorded that he still prospered, right? Did he have freedom? No. Did he have the life he wanted? No. Did he still prosper? Yes. Embedded in every season is an opportunity to prosper. Whether you up, you can prosper. Whether you down, you can prosper. Prosperity is a continual thing. It operates on a cycle. But in order to make it to the future moment you're waiting for, you must manage your present season. If you're in a hard season, you need to manage it well. If you're on the mountaintop, you need to manage it well. You must decide in whatever season you're in, you have to prosper because God is still with you. Just because it doesn't look like, you know, what you want it to look like doesn't mean that you can't that you can decide to just coast. I'm just going to coast through this season. I'm not going to do anything. No. Work the dry season. There is prosperity in the dry season for you. There will still be blessings available to you there. So we can look at Joseph going into this prison as a negative, but can we think of it another way? I think we should think of it also as another upgrade though. Remember I told you that you can be profitable in the down season. Joseph has gone from family business, manager of an entire estate to being the manager of an entire governmental prison in the region. Joseph moved, even though it was a low season for him, he moved from a manager of an estate. It was He was still elevated, though, to be the manager of an entire governmental prison in the region. How do I know this? Let's go back to verse 22 through 23. It says, so the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So the prison at least housed royal detainees. We do know this. They, the prison housed royal detainees because that's how the butler and the baker got there. And these, they weren't the only ones there, though. These are other people who are awaiting their fate. So this lets us know that Joseph was uh, kind of trusted to manage important state assets or important state intelligences as we're thinking about people. It wasn't really a downgrade. It aesthetically on the outside, it did look like a downgrade, but he was just elevated. He was just promoted to manage an entire governmental prison. He's second in command to the warden here, right? Did y'all see that? Am I making it up? Let me know if y'all see the same thing I'm looking at. Let me know. I'm going to be on here longer than uh, an hour, Nikki, so you ain't got to remind me, girl. <laughs> I'm on here. Number seven. Number seven. You must understand that your life has prepared you for these time-released increases. You must understand that your life has prepared you for time-released increases. And how do I know? We're just going to rewalk what I just told you before Joseph becomes second in command to Pharaoh. And this is where we like to shout and run like from the pit to the palace. That didn't happen like that. But before Joseph made it to Pharaoh, it's important to note that he was being prepared to reign his entire life. Every season 
was preparing him for the final season of what he saw in his dreams. Number one, Joseph managed to flock with his brothers before they sold him into slavery. That's Genesis 37 and two. That's his family business. Number two, Joseph was in charge of Potiphar's house and everything he owned. That's Genesis 39 and four. He was a manager over a private estate. Number three, Joseph was in charge of everyone in the prison and was responsible for everything that was done. That's Genesis 39 and 23. So he was the manager over governmental subjects um, and people who I like to say had G14 classified clearances, right? Because these are royal detainees. That mean that they worked in the royal house. So all of these positions prepared him to become second in command to Pharaoh later. Remember, I always tell y'all, we have to live our lives according to divine systems. I mean, to divine timetables and timelines. Everything Joseph endured, he was still in the will of God. And it was just a divine timeline for him to have to, to, to step into these seasons. Nothing is random. Everything in your life up until this moment prepared you to maintain the season that you're in right now. Everything. The stuff that you think is random, the stuff that you didn't like, the stuff that made you cry, made you rock at night, all the things prepare you for this season right here and will ultimately prepare you for the next season. So this isn't your life isn't a pit to the palace conversation either, because that would mean if this was a pit to the palace without any preparation, that would mean that Joseph would be unable to sustain his position as governor when he makes it to Pharaoh's house. This story is about managing incremental increase, which will yield permanent a permanent and sustainable lifestyle. Number eight, you must not move in your own strength. Number eight, you must not move in your own strength. Y'all, this is, this is hard, even for me. This is hard, but this story reminds us that we can't afford to move in our own strength because we don't know enough. In Genesis 40 and 8, when Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker are thrown into the prison and they have dreams, no one is able to interpret them, right? But remember, Joseph has this gift. Your gifts will make room for you. Joseph has this familial gift, right? So Joseph steps up to do the task. But before he steps up to, to do the task, he announces that it is God who will do it through him. So he's giving the glory back to God. The Bible, verse eight says, then Joseph said to him, do not inter interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. And then he interprets both of their dreams. The cupbearer, of course, we know had a favorable dream while the baker didn't. And Joseph is uh, shifting the pressure and bringing things back to pass to God. So he's saying, I can interpret this, but the one who's really interpreting it is the one who is working through me, God. You don't want to take the glory from God, right? And I'm not saying to have like false humility or nothing like that. I'm just saying this. Let's be clear on who gives you the power to what? Create wealth. Let's, who, let's be clear that you have the mind of Christ because God is giving you these gifts and talents and these abilities. Like, let's just be clear to keep the main thing the main thing. So Joseph is saying God will do his part. But he's going to work through me to do his part. Joseph is not trying to move in his own strength. He is moving in the strength that God gives him. Number nine, because I need to move through this a little bit faster. You need divine connections. I know we got that no new friends stuff, but that no new friends stuff and your inability to connect with people will keep you bound to a, to a level that you don't belong at anymore. You need divine connections. God interpreted uh, the cupbearer's dream to help Joseph make a divine connection here. It was all strategic. Yes, the cupbearer knew who Joseph was because Joseph, why, was over everyone in the prison. Yes, Joseph interpreted his dream, but the interpretation was so that the cupbearer would help Joseph in the future. This is a divine connection here. We're in the same place at the same time. This is divine, but this is for a future moment. In Genesis 40 and 21, the cupbearer was restored to his position as chief cupbearer in the palace. It says so that he will so that he once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So it's not 
you know, when we think about a cupbearer, it's not that he's like cooking or anything. He's literally standing next to Pharaoh, putting his cup in his hand. He's hearing all of the, the chatter. He's hearing all of the information. He is literally in close proximity to Pharaoh. Essentially, God needed someone who knew Joseph, right? Because he has to bring these dreams to pass that he gave him at 17. God needed a divine connection, a human. Your elevation is attached to a human. <laughs> God needed someone who knew Joseph that was in close proximity to Pharaoh to help bring forth the plan of for Joseph's life. I'm telling you this to tell you, you cannot do this alone. I'm telling this to tell you that you were never supposed to. God always sends destiny helpers to get you from one destination to another, but you must perceive the help. You must perceive the help. Joseph perceived that the cupbearer was his destiny connection. And I'm not lying. How do I know this? Let's go to verse 14. It says, um, he says, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness and mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. So Joseph could have left, you know, the dream interpretation at that. But he perceived that this man was his destiny helper. Ask the Lord to help you perceive the help that he's sending you. OK, this ain't, oh, I'm just going to do this thing and leave it alone. No, these are probably people strategically placed who are connected to someone you may need in the next season that will remember you. Ask the Lord to release your destiny helpers. Number 10, you must solve a problem to continue increasing. All right. This is where we get into the like the business aspect of it. You must solve a problem to continue increasing. So Joseph makes it out of the prison because he had the answer to. Pharaoh's problem, right? Pharaoh had two troubling dreams and no one could interpret them, which prompted the cupbearer, who is Joseph's destiny helper, to remember that Joseph might have a solution. This takes us to Genesis 41, verse 12 through 13. If you want to turn your Bible there, Genesis, can y'all write that scripture reference down? Genesis 41, 12 through 13, it says, the cupbearer says, now, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the, the interpretation of his dream. Verse 13. And things turned out exactly as he in interpreted them as. I mean, he, and things turned out exactly as he interpreted, interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other man was appalled. OK, so in verse 15, Pharaoh says, I have a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard your gifts and talents make room for you. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. So Joseph has to stand in the familial gift that God gave everyone in the family. So we see that the only reason that Joseph made it out of the pit was because he had the wherewithal to solve the problem. But Joseph had to be willing to help someone in prison, in his prison season. He had to be willing to help this person, even though they was going to be free before him. And that's what we start hating. The cupbearer was going to get out first. Joseph, still in the pit, had to be willing to help him because he already knew he was getting out first. That's your test. Are you willing to help the person who's next, even though you're coming up? I can't tell y'all how many years I spent helping the person that was next and behind the scenes bill and they're millionaires now. And I used to like look and be like, man, I wish one day this will be for me and this will be God's will for me. But I had to be willing to invest my gifts and talents to help them go into their next season. And they're, they're there, multimillionaires. You have to be willing Though they may have something you want and desire, you have to be willing to help the next person. This is your test. Pass your test. You're coming up, but there's someone a little bit closer to you. I mean, than you. Are you willing to help this person who is closer to the finish line than you? Or are you going to sit on your gifts and talents on your hands and be a hater and basically tie yourself to a lesser place? No. Let me tell y'all too, and this is not, this is an aside. I already tell the people who are regularly on my streams, majority, all of my friends are married. 
You know what I give all of my friends who get married? Tiffany wine glasses. Sewing into their lives. I love marriage. I know y'all got it. And this is not me saying I want to sew where I want to go. I don't have any biblical reference for that. And I don't know why I believe you say that. But this is me saying, I love that you made it to a place where I want to be. I'm not going to hate on you. I'm going to do everything I can to support you because you have made it here. And I'm going to give a really fantastic gift to everyone I know who gets married. That's the test. You're going to have to pass the, the hating test. Okay. We also learned that God needed Joseph to save the lives in Egypt. And this takes us to Genesis 45 and 5. Genesis 45 and 5, Joseph tells his brothers when they return um, for the second time, he says, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save the lives that God sent me ahead of you. Verse 6, for two years now, there have been a famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you, a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. You're going to have to have the, the, a better attitude when people basically come back to you for help or come back to you and say, I always knew you could do it. You're going to have to have a better attitude, right? You can't be like, mm hmm, you should have believed in me. No, don't do that. The success needs no boasting. The success speaks for itself. The elevation speaks for itself. Right. Number 11. Increase is attached to discerning God moments. Number 11. Increase is attached to discerning God moments. All right. So Pharaoh and this is also where we we we, we stumble. We cause our lives to fumble because we can't discern a God moment. And I need us to be a little bit more perceptive this year because there will be a lot of God moments available unto us. A lot, a lot. If he tells us, and I said this in the teaching last week, if daily he loads us with benefits, that means daily he's also loading you with opportunities to exercise those benefits. But if you don't look for the opportunities in your day, you're never going to capitalize on them. And then you're going to fall behind. I know we like to um, say sometimes that you're exactly where you're supposed to be. You may be in the season that you're supposed to be in, but you may not be in the day you're supposed to be in. And by day, I'm not talking about your physical day. I'm talking about the day that was scheduled for you to be in in the spirit realm. You can be in the season and not be in the day. That means you could be behind. You got to catch up. You need to look every day is pregnant with opportunity for you to discern God moments. So Pharaoh sends for Joseph, who is still in prison. In verse 14, it tells us that when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. So y'all, I know we like to say like, I'm just going to show up and they just going to have to accept me. And they, you know, I'm not changing nothing for nobody when I get to this next level. Why, why we do that? Because clearly here we're looking that when it's time for Joseph to elevate, the Bible says when he changed his, when he shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. So Joseph could not step into his divine moment and destiny looking like the previous season, still looking like everything he went through. How do I know this? Because he shaved and changed his clothes. Then he went. Essentially, he showed up suitably because he discerned that he was entering a God moment. His connection with God throughout his life allow him to perceive that this was the moment that he was awaiting. He didn't have to go back and pray and wait for three days, because that's what we like to do when we're scared to step into the destiny that we've been praying for. We want to go back and pray and go on a three-day fast. Have you? Are you prepared to step into this moment or not? Have you spent enough time with God in your down season when you know without a shadow of a doubt that this is him, this is the moment, you need to be prepared for it because you can say, okay, I want to go pray about it for three days. And the opportunity has shifted because this was a divine opportunity. This was a window of time for him to step into. Have you done enough of the work before you get to the season that you've been praying about and dreaming about to know this is God. 
This is a God thing. Now, yeah, you can still have the conversations with God. I'm just saying, do not delay the open door that may be pre presented to you because you're scared to go into it because you don't, because you're really scared to elevate. You're really scared. Joseph was prepared here. He waited all this time. He even said, don't, don't forget me when you get out. When you get out, get me out. That meant that he was also preparing. So when his time came, all he had to do was shave, change clothes, and then go. Okay? Number 12. Number 12. It's 20 of these, y'all, but we moving through. You must have wisdom to manage increase. You must have wisdom to manage increase. Okay, so the first act of wisdom that Joseph showcases is his dependence on his dependence on God. You have to learn how to be dependent on God. In all the kingdom teachings, I tell uh, I tell y'all, we're too independent. We're supposed to come to God as what? A child, because he tells you, unless you come to me as a child, you're not even going to get a look at a kingdom, let alone get in it. So Joseph showcases his dependence on God. Remember, you don't have to take care of yourself. You don't have to. I mean, if you want to be grown, then you could be grown. But my mom used to always tell me, this is why I know we could never live together unless we had to. She always just tell me two grown people can't stand the same under the same roof. <laughs> that meant if you under my roof and you still trying to be grown, to, to be grown, you're going to have to go on ahead. Right. Two grown people, y'all can't manage God's stuff. You're a manager. You're not an owner here. Right. So Joseph showcases his dependence on God and verse 16 reads, this is Joseph saying, I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So Joseph saying, it ain't me. Again, he's saying, I'm depending on God here. If God don't do it, I don't know who's going to do it because I can't do it. Right. Um, but Joseph is saying, I can't do this, but God can do it. God will do this for Pharaoh. Right. So in verses 17 through 24, Pharaoh tells Joseph about the dreams containing seven fat cows and seven lean cows and seven soft stalks of grain. God gives Joseph the revelation about the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine and the season and the reason as to why God gave Pharaoh the dreams. So it's important to remember that Joseph is not secured in abundance when he speaks to Pharaoh. He's not secured in the abundant season yet. In fact, he was just brought out of prison. Remember where he just came from? He he just got out of prison two hours ago. I don't know if it's two hours ago, but roll with me. He just got out of prison two hours ago, but he has the wisdom of the Lord that he gained in his time of preparation. So one, you have to also remember that one of the meanings of increase is what? Wisdom. So Joseph has the wisdom that will sustain him when Egypt goes through seven years of plenty and seven years of scarcity. This brings us to number 13. Increase is attached to strategy. Increase is, a strat is attached to strategy. All right, we're going to wrap it on up. So it's not enough to just get in a room, y'all. We must understand this. I don't know why believers, we just be like, I just need to get in a room. No, it's not enough for you to get in a room. That's the starting point. It's important that you have strategy to stay in the room. You're not just trying to get in the room. You're trying to stay there. So not only did Joseph give Pharaoh the interpretation of the dream and the reason God gave Pharaoh the dream, but he gave Pharaoh something presumably for free that he didn't ask for. And what was that? Joseph gave Pharaoh God-given strategy for the present and the future and provides the reasoning. This takes us to verse 33 through 36. Verse 33 through 36. This is what Joseph says. Look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Strategy one. Appoint commissioners over the land. Strategy two. Have the commissioners take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Strategy three. The specific direction he gives is number four, collect all the food of, the, of these good years that are coming and store up the grain to be kept in the cities for food. Number five, what, is he, what else does he tell them? The food should be held in a reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by famine. Joseph literally just gave Pharaoh a strategic plan. 
God gave you these dreams, Pharaoh. You couldn't interpret them. Not only was I able to interpret them, but I'm also able to give you strategy on how to move. It's not enough to have the dream. You need to know what it means and you need to know how to strategically move after you have the dream. What did the concordance tell you that a dream was? The lowest form of prophecy. Number 14. Increase is attached to God's prophetic words about you. Increase is attached to God's prophetic words about you. God showed Joseph in a dream when he was 17 that he will rise to great prominence. We all agree there. When Joseph shares his dream in Genesis 37 and 7, in the first part, he recalls that we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Arose because it says, suddenly my sheaf arose and stood upright. A rose in a spiritual sense means to become powerful, to be established, or to be confirmed. God, in a dream, shows Joseph when that sheaf arose, he was telling him, you are going to become powerful. You're going to become established. You're going to be confirmed. What does definition, the definition of a rose mean? You're going to move upward, or you're going to come into being or attention. I looked up upright because it says that my sheep arose and stood upright. And I looked up, what does upright mean? Upright, according to the concordance, means to be set over, to be established, to be stationed, or to be appointed. Let me drop these in the chat for you. Upright means to be over, to set, to be set over, to be established, to be stationed, and to be interpreted and to be appointed. This is why you need to know what God is saying to you in your dreams. Just by this one line, when we were binding sheaves of grain and out of the field when suddenly my sheep arose and stood upright, that little phrase, my sheep arose and stood upright, two, three, four, five, six words meant you're going to become powerful. You're going to be established. You're going to be confirmed. You're going to be set over. You're going to be stationed. You're going to be appointed. This is why you just can't say, oh, I had this dream and go about your business. You need to, no, let's go ahead, Holy Spirit, you got the Holy Ghost. He's your helper, right? He can help you interpret these dreams and tell you what's next and what's coming for you. So basically in Genesis 41, verse 40 through 41, when Pharaoh says to Joseph, you should be in charge of my palace and all my people who are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. When Pharaoh says that, God is fulfilling his word to Joseph that he gave him in a dream at 17 to make him powerful, to establish him, to set him over things, and to appoint him into prominence. But at this time, this is where we lose heart. And this time, Joseph is 30. God gives him a dream at 17. He goes from... Family business, manager of a family in the family, an employee in the family business. When he goes to Potter's first house, he becomes a manager of a, a private estate. When he's in prison, he becomes the manager of governmental subjects in the region. And now at 30, he's standing before Pharaoh. And the promise is beginning to become fulfilled. How do we know that Joseph is 30? Verse four, uh, Genesis 41 through um, Genesis 41, verse 46 tells us Joseph was 36 years. I mean, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So there was a 13 year process that Joseph had to endure in order to step into the promise of God. But in order to do that, he had to steward all those other steps, all those other jobs properly. This was not just a, just down and up. This was strategic preparation that allowed him to be ready to be able to stay in the position of power when he finally got to Pharaoh's house. It would be, it would be foolish for God to allow you to go from one level to the top knowing that it won't, you won't be able to sustain it. 
You won't be able to sustain it. Your character may not be able to sustain it. Your mentality may not be able to sustain it. Your habits may not be able to sustain it. That's why all of he's, he's giving you steps. He didn't just give Joseph an elevator ride. These were, he took the stairs, the scenic route, the long route. Why? Because when God is thinking about elevation and he's thinking about promotion, he's thinking about at least three generations. I say it all the time. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in order for you not to, I was going to say trick off, but that's not what the phrase I want to use. In order for you not to waste someone else's inheritance in order for you not to eat someone else's inheritance right because this is supposed to be passed down in your family he has to take you whoever decides to take up the work who says that this stuff was going to stop with me we're going to follow god he has to take you the long route so you, you you're going to get the brunt end of it because you have to be able to sustain it and build out the, the systems and the structures in order for the next generations to sustain it or to step into it, to, to have access to it. Let's go to part two of the dream. Part two of the first dream, Joseph says, while your sheaves gathered around mine, bow, and, while your sheaves gather around mine and bow down to it. So let me go back. I'm sorry. I got off track. <laughs> Let's read. Where was I at my notes? Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay, we're looking at two dreams. I'm sorry, y'all. We're looking at two dreams. First dreams, it was when we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose instead of right. The second part of the dream says, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. So that comes to pass. Remember, the point we're at is increases attached to God's prophetic words about you and your dreams are the lowest form of prophecy. The second part of the dream um, comes to pass for Joseph in Genesis 42 and 6 and also in Genesis 43 and 26. How do we know? Genesis 42 and 6 says, now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Okay. So that is when, that's the part, the second part of the dream when Joseph says, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bow down to it. Verse uh, Genesis 43 and 26 says, when Joseph came home, they presented him with gifts they had brought into the house and they bowed down before him to the ground. So we see them bowing again. Dream two, he gives. He says, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And we see that the rest, that part of the dream comes to pass in Genesis 46, when his father and brothers and the other tribes of Israel, totaling seven, 70 people, relocate to Egypt. Okay? Number 15. We got five more after this one. Number 15. God's idea of family is attached to increase. I know we like to think that God don't want to increase us and we don't. I don't know. I don't know why we do that, but I think it's a lie from hell because everything in creation is will reproduce after its own kind and if god is the god who owns a cattle of a thousand hills and he's like basically showing off his resume in the bible and he's telling you like yo i'm gonna increase you you obey me i'm going to increase is always on god's mind because you can't be a king without thinking about increase you can't be god without thinking about how these things will increase how these numbers will become great even when he's telling abraham your seat will be as the sand. This is increase. So when, but also remember that the first institution that God instills in the earth is family. Family is important. So why would you think God will put you in a family and not expect the entire family to increase? Why would you, why would you want a family if you can't increase the family? Your increase should be by nature that thing that just comes to pass, right? Because you're embedded to increase. You are created to increase. So God's idea of family is attached to increase. Genesis 41 through 45, um, verse 45, it says, Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zapanath Paniah, I hope I said that right, and gave him a Seneth, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, to be his wife. Then if we move down to verse 50, it says, 
Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by a Seneth, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Verse 51, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. Verse 52, the second son he named was Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Okay, so we see that God's increase for Joseph is not only attached to him, but for his family, which also made Joseph's life richer. God also blessed Joseph to be a blessing to his father, his brothers, and their children, as illustrated in verse, I mean, in Genesis 47. Okay? So your increase, remember, your increase is always attached to your family. It's just not about you. God is thinking about three generations all the time, including your cousins and them. Right? Number 16, increase is attached to working the strategy. All right, y'all. This is where we're finna get into uh, scalability here. Increase, the rest of this is scalability. Increase is attached to working the strategy. This is Genesis 41, verse 47 through 49. It says, during the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in his field surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping record because it was beyond measure. So we see here that Joseph actually worked the steps within the strategy that God gave him for seven years, right? He didn't, God didn't give another strategy. The strategy that Joseph gave Pharaoh was the very strategy that Joseph worked for seven years. He didn't get another strategy. When God gives you a strategy, you continue to work that strategy until it yields you the reward you're looking for. Don't ask for another one. The strategy is going to work. Don't try to get another strategy. God didn't give Joseph another strategy. Joseph worked the same strategy for seven years because the one God gave was multidimensional and it was ensured to work. Any strategy that God gives you is not just like one thing in it. You work that one strategy, other aspects will start cropping up and opening up and unlocking unto you. The issue is that we get frustrated with the time the time, the, the lapse in time, right? Time starts speaking to you. And so we want to go and get another strategy because someone else said it was going to work for them. But the strategy that God gave you is attached to the destiny and the destiny of your family, not attached to what these other people are doing. Remember when we first came into the year and the strategic um, video I did, I said, the strategy of other people won't work for you in this season. You need to get a tailored strategy for your purpose and your destiny. You can't go with what the, the masses are saying. It's not going to work for you. It's not. It's going to work for them. It's not going to work for you. So that video is under this same playlist um, if you want to go ahead and review it. So we have to commit uh, to the strategy that God gives and continue to work it until he gives us another. Do not stop your strategy prematurely. Joseph worked the same strategy for seven whole years. Number 17, increase is attached to production and sales. And this is where we struggle. Increase is attached to production or sales. We see that in Genesis 41, verse 56 through 57. Genesis 41, verse 56 through 57 reads... When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe, severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. So if you work God's strategy, then you won't have the same financial pressure as the rest of the world. Can we agree here? If you work the strategic plan that God gives you, when the financial pressure happens to the rest of the world, you're exempt. It's not going to happen to you. So when the world was going down, where was Joseph going? All the way up. 
because he worked the strategy in the previous season. For seven years, he worked the same strategy that he told Pharaoh to do. So when the, 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 when the event came, when the catastrophe happened and everybody else started going down, where'd Joseph go? It's like a seesaw, but Joseph ain't going down. He's going up. How do we know this? Because the scripture says all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere, meaning Joseph was now in commerce. Joseph is now in commerce because he listened to the strategy that God gave him seven years prior and managed the resources during the seven years of plenty. So he was in a position to increase even more by selling in the time of famine. So just because y'all, let me tell y'all this. Just because people are broke in recessions doesn't mean that you have to be broke in recession with them. If someone needs something, then they will buy it or they're going to find a way to get it. You, when you step into commerce, you can't count people's pockets for them. Why are you counting people's pockets for them? If they don't have it, they're not your customer. Make your price your price. We see Joseph do that, and I'm going to show you how Joseph did that. Verse 18, verse 18, I mean, verse 18, <laughs> number 18, increase is predicated on your ability to update your strategy to address new problems. So we see Joseph interprets the dream. We see him give the strategy. We see him work the strategy and the strategy is working. But in order for him to scale, he has to update the strategy. So God gave Joseph the initial strategy, but because Joseph knew about management, how do we know he knew about management? He was an employee in a family business. He managed someone's private estate. He managed uh, the governmental prison in the region. And now he's managing um, the affairs as the governor, second in command to Pharaoh. This is how we know that God didn't just automatically from nowhere, abracadabra, put him in the palace because he needed to learn management skills that will sustain him, that would allow him to become a co-laborer in this thing with God, which would allow him. So Joseph didn't have to go back to God and say, <clears throat> he didn't have to go back and God to God and say, okay, we need another strategy. No, he was skilled in management. This is him putting on his thinking cap. My second grade teacher used to always tell us, put on your thinking cap. Because Joseph is trained in management, he don't have to go back and ask. He knows what should happen next. He was able to update the original strategy to dominate. Let's go to the text. Joseph originally collected all the food, stored it out, and sold it. But now there's no more food. So he has to update the strategy. This is pro new problem number one. This takes us to Genesis 47, 13 through 15. Genesis 47, 13 through 15, it says, there was no food. <laughs> However, the whole region, because of the famine was so severe. I mean, there was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was so severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying. And he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. Verse 15, when the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is all gone. This is the new strategy. We see the new strategy. Let's go back to the text. The problem is there is no food in the whole region because the famine was so severe, both in Egypt and Canaan, wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was supposed to be found in Egypt and Can Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying, right? And he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, they came to Joseph and said, we need some food, we don't have no money. Why should we die? We don't have no money. 
look at Genesis 47 and 16. We have a new strategy. Genesis 47 and 16, it says, Joseph says, this is the updated strategy. Then bring me your livestock. I will sell you food in exchange for your livestock since your money is gone. That's scalability. You don't have no money? Give me your, give me your, give me your livestock. He didn't, he didn't offer no discount. He said, what else do you have that's valuable? Solution. What's the solution? Genesis 47 through 17. Genesis 47 verse 17. It says, so they brought their livestock to Joseph and he gave them the food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and goats, their cattle and donkeys. He brought them through that year with food in exchange for their all their livestock. Let's go back. God gave Joseph the ability, the gift, because the gifts will make room for you. All y'all who sitting on your gifts need to stop. He gives him this family gift to interpret this dream about this impending danger that's on the horizon. Since he can interpret it, he also, God gave also Joseph the ability to help Pharaoh strategize. He creates the strategic plan. He tells Pharaoh, this is the strategic plan. Pharaoh says, let me put you, you're the man. You're the governor now. Joseph works the strategic plan for seven years until the famine hits. The famine hits, the people run out of money. Joseph says, okay, we still in business here. Give me your livestock because you didn't prepare. Give me your livestock, right? Since your money is gone. The people bring their livestock to Joseph in exchange for, and what is their livestock? Horses, sheep, goats, cattle, donkey, all the things. Give me, give me the next valuable thing here. And it says, and he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all their livestock. So he saved their lives. But now we got another problem. Problem two, Genesis 47, 18 through 19. Genesis 47, 18 through 19. Problem two. This is where we're going to have to see Joseph updated again. Excuse me. It says, um, when that year was over, they came to him the following year, right? So this is the next year. When that year was over, they came to him the following year and said, we cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes? We and our land, uh, why should we perish before your eyes? We and our land as well. Buy us and our land in exchange for food. So these folks are about to start selling themselves. Buy us, because desperation will have you doing some things. Buy us and our land in exchange for food. And we with our land will be in bondage to, to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may live and not die and that the land may not become desolate. New strategy. New strategy, the updated strategy here is Genesis 47, 20 through 21. Joseph already took their money. He already got the livestock. Genesis 47, verse 20 through 21 says, so Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. So he updated the strategy. The solution, we find it in verse 47, I mean, chapter 47, 23. So verse 23, we find the next solution. It says, Joseph said to the people, now that I've bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you so you can plant the ground. So Joseph worked the original strategy. The next year, another problem arose. Joseph tinkers with the strategy to be successful that year. The next year, another problem arose that's still connected to the first problem. It's a domino effect. Joseph in his wisdom, because he has management capabilities and strategies and understands how to manage things, updates the strategy again. And now, it's he, now that the land is his, right? The land is Pharaoh's, we saw it. They sold it to him. Joseph says, now that I've bought you and your land today, here is seed so that you can plant on the ground that we now own. 
verse 19, it gets better. Chapter 19. I mean, number 19, managing increase means creating passive income opportunities. We're going to Genesis 47, 24, which is the next verse uh, under 23. Managing increase means creating passive income opportunities. It says, but when the crop comes in, so Joseph is saying, here's the seed. Go ahead and plant it on the land that we now own. So we're giving you the ability. We're, we're like this investor. We're going to give you the initial capital for you to go ahead and plant in what we already own. And then this is where verse 24 picks up. It says, but when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as seed for the fields and as food for yourselves and your households and your children. So Joseph here creates a system that ensures Pharaoh will not only own everything, but he will also have passive income. How do we know that Pharaoh will have passive income? Because it says Pharaoh will collect one fifth profit from everyone, which will ensure that he stays on top. We don't see Joseph going back to God right now. We see him worth standing in wisdom. We see him standing in the wisdom that the process has prepared him to stand in. He don't need to go back for another plan. He's just building on the plan that God gave because he didn't just go from the pit to the palace. He went from the family business, an employee in the family business. I have to keep reminding you this. He went from employee in the family business to the manager of a private estate to overseeing or managing the governmental prison to being a governor in Pharaoh's household. Because of all of those steps, that process that was ugly, that didn't feel like it was the promise, that was it, we couldn't see them. We couldn't see how this thing would lead up here. Now we're starting to see every management thing that Joseph learned, every job, every experience prepared him to not only be governor in Pharaoh's house or in Egypt, but it also allowed him to ensure that the wealth would continue. How do I know that this would ensure that the wealth will continue? This brings us to point 20. Managing increase properly is connected to generational wealth and legislation. Managing increase properly is connected to generational wealth and legislation. Genesis 47, 26. Read. So Joseph established it as a law. Because when you're in positions and you own things, you can influence laws. This is why we need more believers with more. So Joseph establishes as a law concerning land in Egypt, still in force today, that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not be, um, become pharaohs. So the law that Joseph implements secured generational wealth, not only for Pharaoh, but for those attached to Joseph. Remember I said increase, God is thinking about the increase of those attached to you, of, of your family. How do I know this? Because if we go to Genesis 47, 27, which is just the next verse, it says, now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Who? The 12 tribes of Israel. These tribes were connected to Joseph. So when Joseph goes to get his father and all of them, they get to settle in the best land. They get to settle in Goshen, which secures their generational wealth. So let me just be clear here. Who is, uh, what tribe is known for money? The tribe of Zebulun, I think. So we like to quote, we like to ask God for the wisdom of the sons of Issachar, right? Who discerned the times and the season? And that's important. But it was in a previous teaching that I did, maybe last year. We learned also that the tribe of Zebulun underwrote the efforts of the tribe of Issachar. How did they underwrite? the endeavors of the tribe of Iskar because they were great with money. They were great with commerce. 
All of this is together, it's interconnected. So as you are asking God for the wisdom and the strategy and the understanding of the times of the, of the sons of Issachar who discerned the times in the season, be clear to also ask them for the anointing, ask him for the anointing of the sons of Zebulun who were the financiers. They get to this point. Issachar and them can do what they can do. Zebulun can do what they can do. I forget what the tribe who's known as the fighting tribe, but all of the tribes can do what they can do because Joseph made it out and managed the season well. This created a generational cycle, generational blessings. That's all I got today. We're an hour and a half. Uh, did y'all learn something? Did y'all learn something from today's strategy session? Let me know. Let me look in the chat. Because if you look in the Bible, the Bible got what you need, y'all. We need to, let's not romanticize the Bible. Let's actually look, ask God to help you see the strategies for elevation. Um, I'm looking in the chat. If you haven't liked the video, please like the video. Mm, y'all good? Did we learn something? What we got? Sorry, Derek, I said this so good. Ms. Wu said this is true. Tia says I'm loving this series. Thank you. Sub Lilo. Lilo. I hope I'm saying this correctly. I'm sorry. Yesterday's price is not today's price. Vanessa says this is so good. Talaya says absolutely this confirmation. Everything I just prayed about last night. Fantastic. Talaya, I'm sending you a message today. Um, y'all, if y'all want to book a one-on-one -on -one strategy session with me, you can click this pinned message here and book your strategy session with me at BriannaWhiteside.com. As you can see, I'm fantastic at helping people create systems and structures around their lives. It's really connected to my anointing. Um, but if you would like to book a strategy session with me and shorten the distance between where you are and where you want to go, go ahead and head to BriannaWhiteside.com and book your strategy session with me. Love to Life T says, yes, my increase is attached to my family and Joseph was not from the pit to the balance. He was not. And we we should stop lying. <laughs> I don't know another way to say it, but to say we just need to stop lying because it sets us up to believe something that's just not true. And then we're frustrated and we're praying to God and asking God, do it like you did for Joseph, right? And he like, okay, I'm going to do it like I did for Joseph. And he like, no, nah, nah, I don't, nah, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that. <laughs> you ain't doing for Joseph like that. And he's like, if you would read my text, if you would actually read Joseph's life and not take snippets and tidbits out of it, you would see that this is the blueprint for elevation, sustainability, and scalability. You would see that, but because you won't read the Bible and you just listen to what people are saying, you won't read it for yourself. We have to study to show yourself approved, y'all. You have to, if you actually read the Bible and not just like go with what you've heard of the stories, um, you would be further along this year. You will. Um, yeah, you will. And majority of what you, everything you need is in this Bible. You just have to know how to look for it. And we, I don't, when I approach the Bible, I don't approach the Bible like in a hyper spiritual way. I approach the Bible to look for practical application because if I, as I've told y'all, even when we're studying the kingdom series, the Bible is a book of rules and laws and principles. So if this is the book we've been given to study or to give us clarity or understanding or wisdom on how we should live our lives, that means that we should be looking for the rules, the laws, and the principles that will allow us to live a better life here on earth. And also stay in our relationship with God, right? And so when I approach the Bible in this way, it unlocks. 
So I'm telling you that to tell you the the lens through which you are looking at the Bible does matter. If I'm approaching the Bible because I'm studying for the kingdom message, which I am, um, we're going to resume in in March. I am looking through a kingdom lens. And so I'm looking for specific things and it will unlock. So what you look for, God will reveal to you. I think the scripture said is, is the joy of the the God to conceal a matter and the joy of him to figure it out or search it out, something like that. It's in a Bible, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's there and it will save you time. It will save you some heartache. It will save you some frustration, but it'll also save you some money too, you know? And so I want you all to remember that um, you were wired to elevate. You just need strategy. Strategy is the way you get from here to there. From here to there, you need a strategy. You know what I'm saying? So if you need a strategy and if you need help tailoring something, working through an idea, I'm your girl. Head over to BriannaWhiteside.com. It's right there uh, pinned in the chat box and book a strategy session with me. What else I want to tell y'all? Oh, this don't have nothing to do with the message because I'm done teaching. Um, I do have another strategy for prayer, y'all, because... Let me tell y'all, I need to grow in prayer. I knew that I've been knowing that I need to grow in the in the area of prayer. And um, I couldn't just figure out like how to <laughs> how to build up the momentum of prayer. You know what I mean? Like how to pray for more than one for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you know, how to build up the stamina. And so since it's strategy Tuesday, I'm just gonna tell you what I've been doing. Um, I also want to pray more um, in the spirit, right? Pray more in the spirit. And so what I've been doing, if someone need, if you're looking to pray more, um, what I've done or what God let, told me to do, the strategy that he gave me, get you a list of topics. I, mine was like however many topics, 10, maybe 15 topics. Write, write down the topics, write down the categories. And then... Say the category and then pray five minutes per category in the spirit. Now, I don't just sit down and pray every category. Like, I'm not sitting and just praying for this extended time. I am setting my timer because I'm trying to train myself. And I'm saying, we're going to pray for finances for five minutes. And I may be washing dishes or swiffering or making a bit. You know what I mean? Like, I'm doing other things. I may be driving but I'm dedicating five minutes to each category. And it's really helped me pray like for an hour and a half a day. Um, And so I feel the difference in my life. um, And I've been doing it for a few days now. I feel the difference in my life. And so you can use that strategy um, if you want to increase your your prayer time. Uh, But yeah, so... (sighs) I've been on here an hour and a half. That's all I got. I have not eaten today. Um, So I'm pretty hungry. Let me look in the chat. Let's see. Story of Derrica said, man, this is so good. Thank you, girl. (coughs) Um, Brittany says, this is amazing. Thank you. Hey, Brittany. Thank you. Are you new here, right? Are you new around here? Hey. Marcel said, "Um, what is the strategy for getting our dreams interested? Interested, Marcel, or do you mean interpret it? Because interpretation comes from God. And so if you partner with Holy Spirit and say, I need this dream interpreted, um, and just like sit there and wait on them, or you can, I'm not a dream interpreter, but I know people who do dream interpretations. I think um, you can maybe partner with them, but ultimately I kind of rely on Holy Spirit. And generally my dreams are straightforward dreams. Um of course, you know, you have the soulish dreams and things of that nature, but generally straightforward, I can easily discern um, the interpretation. Here's a strategy that God just dropped on me. Pray, if you, you know, if you pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit for the interpretation of the dream and then wait and see what happens right after you pray in the spirit for the interpretation. Um, because the Holy Spirit is your helper. He's your counselor. And so, you know, if you ask, you know, the Bible tells you seek um, you may at seek, what does it say? Ask, not seek. Y'all know scripture. So that would be what I would say, um, uh, to do. I think that's it. 
I think that's it. That's all I got. Um, Thursday, we're back with another session of the Faith, Love, and Marriage series, Thursday evening. Super excited to have my friends on. Um, it's going to be a time, y'all. I've known them for a while. Um, and so if y'all enjoy Pastor BJ and Jessica, who were on Black Love just recently, you're really going to enjoy the Scots. And I also got a surprise, y'all. Let me tell y'all, I was going to do the session by myself on Valentine's Day, but I got a surprise guest coming on um, <laughs> on on, uh, on Valentine's Day. So you don't want to miss that. And then we are back to the kingdom teaching on Thursdays in March. Also, let me remind you, tomorrow begins on the blog at BriannaWhiteside.com. I begin a new teaching on the blog um, starting tomorrow. So all of the new teachings will drop every Wednesday through February and the guest writers will drop on Friday. I want y'all to pay attention to the blog this month specifically. What I teach on the blog to my site subscribers is not what I teach publicly. Okay. These are two different things. So I'm doing two different things. So pay close, 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 close attention to the blog in February. There is strategy there, a different type of strategy. Um, what else do I need to tell y'all? If you're not subscribed to my mailing list, you can do so at BriannaWhiteside.com. Become an insider. And I think that's it, y'all. <laughs> I think that is all I have. I hope y'all have a fantastic Tuesday. Watch this back. Share this with someone who needs life strategy, strategy on how to elevate, sustain the elevation, and also scale up in their lives. Um, this is no time for us to be playing around. This is no time for us to just be listening to prophetic words that people give us without going back to God asking, what is the strategy for my life? Because to keep just saying, I receive, is not going to get you nowhere. You've received it and probably haven't gotten nowhere because you need practical application, okay? Which means that you need strategy on how to work the words attached to the prophetic word. And, I, and I'm not lying about that because let me look at the email I sent out to my Cypress subscribers today. I'm going to tell, oh, I never posted this thing. I'm going to tell you what Jesus says. Hold on, let me go to it. We are looking at Matthew 7 and 26. Let me go to the text. Matthew 7 and 26 in the Bible. Uh, Matthew 7 and 26. Okay, so this is when Jesus is talking about uh, the wise and the foolish builders. So he starts talking about it in verse 24. Um, so I guess we could read it real quick. It says, therefore, for anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Okay. So you're hearing the word and what are you doing after you hear the word? You're putting it into practice in order for you to put something in practice. You have to strategize. You have to have a strategy on how you're going to put it together. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 25 says the rain came down. The streams arose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had it founda its foundations on the rock. The strategy was built on what God said. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. What is implied in this statement is that you should be doing something with what you heard. There is a skin in the game buy-in that has to happen from you because Jesus is saying, I'm not putting it into practice for you. You have to, I've done the work. I've told you, I've given you the insight. It's up to you. And if you don't put it into practice, you like a foolish man. I'm not calling you foolish. Jesus is calling you foolish. He says, verse 27, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against this house, and it fell with a great crash. So when God, God is telling you to do something, it's generally attached to some future event like we see in the dreams that came to Pharaoh. It's attached to some future event, and he's telling you to do something in this season so that when you get to this future event, you won't be struggling because you didn't build. So he's telling you this in the in the in the in the you know in the previous season, so that when you get to the season that the catastrophe happens, you won't be shaken. But if you don't put what he's telling you to put in practice, you're foolish. 
because the event is going to happen. <laughs> the event is going to happen. Whether you put it into practice or not. Right? You see what I'm saying? Here? So what if some of the storms that you may have experienced, what if you weren't really supposed to feel the full impact of the storm? Because in a previous season, God was saying, hey, do this thing. I'm telling you to do this thing. And you're like, I'm not doing it because I don't know why I'm going to do it. Hey, do this thing. I'm not doing this thing because I want to go watch TV. I don't feel like ain't nobody else doing it. Hey, do this thing. No, I'm not doing it. I'm going to go go to brunch. I'm going to go do what I want to do. And all them times you don't do that thing gets you closer and closer to that event. And you finally reach the event that he was telling you to do the thing that so that you will be safe and you won't feel it. But since you didn't do the thing, you feel the impact of the event. And now you're crying, spinning, farting, and you're saying, God, why? God, you praying. Why God? You know what I'm saying? I hate this season. I, you saying all the things that God said. I tried to warn you in the previous season. I was saying, hey, do this thing. Y'all see what I'm saying here? It was preventative. You were react now. You reactionary when God is trying to be get us to be preventative as opposed to reactionary. Stop reacting. You don't have to react if you prevent. God is a God of prevention. He will tell you these things to prevent certain things, but in our humanness, thinking we know everything because we're so grown, now we got to react. Now we crying, spinning, fire. Now we going through a hard season. Now we, you know, you you. The season may not supposed to have been hard for you. You may have supposed to went through it quickly, glided above it, but now you're in it. Now, you, now you're being consumed by it. You didn't do what he told you during the previous season. So could you be the drama? Are you the drama? I remember, and I'm going to get off because I got work to do. Um, I remember um, like asking God, like, can you give me like the the exciting stuff that people want to hear, you know, like give me the prophetic words about houses and cars and, you know, elevation. Like, I, can you give me the stuff people want to hear to make me, you know, to make me popular? Like, give me like the obscure things. Give me the stuff that people just listening to and be like, Ooh, but don't do nothing. Like, give me that. Cause that draws the crowd. Right. I'm just talking to myself. And he's like, no, <laughs> I'm not giving you that. Because the more that people have of that, the more my people become unprepared. So I'm using you to prepare the person. And I'm like, so I got to be used for the person preparation. Because if you read any of my, if, you're, if you've been looking at any of these strategy videos or majority of my teaching, it focuses on you, what you're supposed to be doing. Not what God is supposed to be doing. We've heard all that. He God going to do his part. We drop our part. Therefore, we're behind. We're unprepared. And then we're praying for things that we wouldn't have had to pray for had we been obedient and did what he told us to do. So there, you know what I'm saying, y'all? So we have to, we're playing catch up now. Now we're playing catch up because we are behind. But we don't have to be. You have to decide that you're not going to be behind in this season, okay? In 2024, you're not going to be behind. You are going to be the head and not the tail. You're going to be above and not beneath. You're going to be the lender and not the borrower. That is good when we quote it, but that, that also suggests that you have a buy-in. You have to do something in order to be these things. Because God, when he birthed you, he wired you to be those things. But your human will, as we learn about Lot, the other week, I don't remember when we learned about him. Was it last week or the week before? Week before, he was our mentor. Your will can stop it. Every time your will can stop it. God will counsel you up into your decision. When you decide enough is, in, I'm not doing no more, you're not going to do no more. He's going to let you not do no more. When you decide I'm satisfied, he's going to let you be satisfied. But there is always more with God. But it may require... That in order for you to get the more, for your latter days to be greater than your former days, you're going to have to give up something in the middle. 
you're going to have to give up something in the middle, right? Y'all saw me crying, spinning, and farting because I had to give up my career. But we in February now. I, I got up. I stopped licking my wounds. I decided this is the path. We're going now. We're going to become unstoppable. Just because I don't have the institutional backing of my, you know, of my university does not mean that I don't have the backing of heaven. If I have the backing of heaven, I'm always going to come out on top. If I partner, if I agree, if I do what is required of me, you too. I am not so special. We are all sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're all heirs. We are all we are all partakers in the divine nature. We are all brothers and sisters, because that's how you're going to be a co-heir with Jesus. We're all seated in heavenly places. All of this is for us. We all have this inheritance. But if you decide you don't want yours, don't be mad when the rest of us take ours, because we all have equal access to it just by be born, be, being born again. This is on you. We learned from Lot. It wasn't a life and death situation that the angels allowed him to settle in Zor. The angels allowed Lot to settle in Zor, though he was told to go to the mountain because he wasn't in danger of dying. The reason that they let him settle in Zor, which is the land of insignificance, because that's what Zor translates to, is because it was a matter of how well do you want to live on earth? Go back and watch that teaching, y'all. Lot was our mentor the week before last. They tell him to go to the mountain, which is a high place. Lot's traumatized. He, been, You know, I walked through how we know he was traumatized, right? He says, let me go to Zor, which is a lesser place. It's a place of insignificance. They say, okay, you can go to Zor. Even though we have more for you, you can settle in Zor, which is insignificant. And we're going to allow you to settle in Zor. Because it's not a life and death situation. It's a, it's a situation of how well do you want to live while you're on earth? You want to live a settled life and have less than what you were created to be and have? We're going to let you do it. You don't have to. But we're going to let you do it, which reminds us of the prodigal son. The father let him go off, do what he was going to do. But the Bible says when he came back to himself, when he remembered who he was and he came back home, he was elevated back and he got what was rightfully his. Again, when you come back to yourself, you can have more if you want more. But it's going to require something of you. You know what I'm saying here? So it's not just for the pulpit. I'm always going to say that it's for the pew. It's for you. Success is not just for the pulpit. It's for the pew. It's for you. Don't count yourself out. I know some of the teachings over the years have skewed this, this, this perspective and this lens through which we see ourselves if we're not pastors or things of that nature. And I love the pastors. I think they're important and they do a wonderful job. I'm just saying that the elevation is for you too. It's for you. When God get told in Genesis 1, he gave you what? He spoke to your spirit and said, dominate. He gave you dominion. Genesis 2, he gave you a body to exercise the dominion and authority. Genesis 3, we lost it with the fall of man. Isaiah tells us, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. The government is the government of the kingdom. Daniel prophesies what he sees as the son of man coming. All of this is in the kingdom series. Daniel prophesies he sees the son of man coming back with the government so that all nations will... will um, will serve him. So when Christ died for you, it wasn't just for salvation sake. It was to bring back the government of the kingdom to get you your inheritance. According to Galatians, take your inheritance, the kingdom that was prepared for you before the foundation of the world. And when Jesus is all on earth doing what he's doing, he's just not doing it for, king, for, for the sake of it. He's doing it to demonstrate what's inside of the kingdom. So then when he dies, because he says the kingdom is at hand, right? The kingdom is near. They couldn't get in the kingdom until he died and rose again. After he died and rose again, he stayed on, on earth for 40 days, teaching the message of the kingdom to the disciples according to Acts. 
When he made the final ascension, he left the Holy Spirit because when he's casting out the devil and they, they're thinking he's casting them out by Beelzebub, I don't remember the demon's name. He's saying, if I cast this out by the spirit of God, you know that the kingdom has come upon near you. The spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is housing the spirit that is still in the kingdom <laughs> because the kingdom is inside of Jesus until he makes that final ascension. And when he makes that final ascension, the kingdom unlocks, which is why we don't see the disciples doing any miracles until the death and resurrection and ascension. You don't see a casting out of a devil through the disciples. You don't see you don't see them performing it because they didn't have access to the kingdom yet. When the when Jesus makes the final ascension, the kingdom unlocks. When he's telling you and I started this off this morning, I mean, the earlier right? The beginning of the teaching when I said, and I had that dream and I asked God, where, what, why are these finances tied up? I'm not praying for money. I'm saying something is tying it up and I don't like it. So tell me the strategy. And he reminds me of that, you know, that section of scripture when Jesus tells them to go to the sea and get the money out of the fish, which lets me know that this is a kingdom situation and that the Marine kingdom will control finances. Pray against it, go get it out of there. Because it's not supposed to be there. It's not theirs. You need a strategy. What if it's not that? You're not doing, you're not working hard. And God don't want to bless you. What if some other kingdom tied up your stuff? But you don't have, you don't, you don't know the strategy to get it. There go your strategy right there. You feel like your finances are stand on that, stand on that story in the Bible. Pray. Pray into that story. I guarantee you they got to give you your stuff back. That's it, y'all. I've been on here two hours. Um, Brittany says exactly this is why I'm grateful to have found this channel because I was waiting on God and he was waiting on me. Yeah, girl. Uh, the story, Derica says, we need to step into this authority and act like it all 2024 and beyond 100%. Yeah, I'm taking y'all with me if y'all come. I don't benefit by being the only one with revelation. I don't benefit by being the only one who's doing what they're supposed to do. The kingdom does not advance by one person. Yeah, we can make strides, but we need collective advancement. One, we need to move forward together. There is strength and safety in numbers. And so I'm going to do my part to bring everybody with me as much as I can, because we don't, we don't benefit when it's only one person at a time. No, we need to all go up together. But I hope y'all enjoyed this strategy session. If you want to book a strategy session with me, you can do so. It is right there pinned in the comment section. Um, I will see y'all Thursday for the Faith, Love, and Marriage series, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And yeah, see y'all on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Wednesday, check out the blog. It drops in the morning, Wednesday morning, because there is a new teaching dropping on the blog. All right, y'all. I'll see y'all soon. I hope y'all have a great day. Watch the replay if you need it. Share it with a friend. Like the video so we can get this word out. Um, and I'll just see y'all Thursday. Bye.